Hello world, this is my third video about the Philippines, so if you've missed those two, I've put the links to them in the description. For this video, how about we ease into things by checking out some homes. First off, let's talk with Jordan, who lives with his sister, her husband, and his nephew, who, just so you know, aren't the other people you see in the house footage. Well, how come you don't have lights on right now? Oh, it's daytime. Yeah, to save energy. Oh, okay. To save money, yeah. Is energy expensive? Yeah, here in Philippines, yeah. While my camera doesn't show it, it's indeed dark in the house and Jordan is right. Energy is expensive in the Philippines, especially Manila. Okay, and the so room. this is your room? The messy room. Fan in your room, and then you got a nice... There's a hole in my a hole. ceiling, yeah. Is that for something? So there's a hole in the ceiling because he's trying to fix a water leak. And this is simply me confirming that those are new shoes on the bed, which they were. This room is messier because they have a kid here. <laughs> a lot of things in here because they have a kid in here. Yeah, and then... Can you see the toys? Oh, wait, you're... Your rooms, there's no wall. Yeah. Just uh, for the ventilation. Oh. This is our bathroom. This is where we poop. That's your toilet bowl. Yeah. Yeah. So do you like just squat over top of yeah. it? So do you use that to clean your bum? Yeah. One hand is like holding the towel, and then one hand is just washing your butt. Oh, you use your hand to wash. Yes. Yeah. That That's makes cool. sense. Let's pause my shaky camera for a sec. So I'm told that a typical middle-class house will use the bucket and towel to wash themselves. There's no shower head, and that you most likely won't have hot water. Everything gets wet, so you'd wear slippers. So this is just drying, right? Yeah. So it's not like a dishwasher. What they told me is that dishwashers in the Philippines are not a popular thing. If you're not wealthy, you can't afford one. If you are wealthy, you'd have a maid do them. And this is me enjoying some Filipino hospitality. Thanks for the mango, Jordan. Next, we visit Jessica and her family, who live in a gated community. Unfortunately, for all the house tours, I did a terrible job of talking and filming at the same time. So, I'll be summarizing conversations a lot. Like this one, this is her father's room, and she said her mom stays at her sister's house, which shares the same backyard as this house. I went on to ask about the CR, the comfort room as it's called in the Philippines, and why not use a curtain to separate the toilet and shower. They don't want to have curtains, but I want to have curtains. It cuts the bathroom. Oh, it makes it too so small. Yes. Make, make a bigger bathroom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing with Filipinos. They don't have, they don't prioritize the bathroom. As long as there is a shower and there is a toilet bowl, that's the bathroom already. So this is my cousin's uh, room. He's staying with us like since he was a little boy, he's been with us already. So it's not just a primary family, like father, daughter, we have my cousin here. This is supposed to be my mom's room. We usually prioritize having tambayans or places where you can hang out. Tambayan. So, yeah, tambayan. We call it tambayan, tambayan like tambay, standby. Okay. So there. So here we have uh, a balcony and then overlooking everything because so we want what are to. You overlooking? Um. My dad's garden. With this footage, I did an even worse job than the house tour and didn't even record sound. However, I was impressed with the variety of fruits, so I wanted to show you. Here are, of course, bananas. And this is actually a banana heart or banana blossom. And this is soursop. Here's a papaya tree. And this is passion fruit. And doggy. -y. Over here is rambutan. This one is named jackfruit. Now we're looking at a gourd. I believe this is a water apple, but I'm not 100% sure. Lastly, this is a pineapple plant. I never knew they looked like this. Now back to the house tour. I love, uh, I love hanging out here. Initially our house is just until this wall. And then we had an extension and then another extension. So Filipinos like to have extensions. Like they, they extend the house as long as they're, they see a space there. As Jessica was showing me around, her real estate mother joined us. Her and her team actually sold many of the houses in this gated community. Are you the top real estate agent? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes uh, the, my three kids finish colleges through my commission. Oh. oh, and this is our third house. 
Third house? Yes, we have in Liti and we have in San Pedro Laguna. So who are those in the other houses? Um, our relatives. Oh, okay. <laughs> so for vacation, we, for vacation, you go there. Um, normal Filipino houses have their altars. Altar. So we have those angels and the holy, uh, the Trinity, uh, the holy family. Then we normally have two dining areas. Two. This is well, wait, for wait, the, why do you have two dining areas? That's the typical this Filipino for house for the visitors, and then that's the family. Yeah, the visitors always end up there. Yes. <laughs> Now I'm skipping ahead a bit, but here's the fourth house I visited. You see the formal dining room and then the two living rooms on the left and the right? Those weren't used during my visit. Instead, it was this tiny little kitchen counter table that we gathered around. I thought it was pretty funny because it's exactly what happens at my dad's place back in Canada. Anyways. Entertainment room? Yes. And yes. <laughs> in, in the room. evening, it's a bedroom. Yes. And this is my room. Oh, this is your room? Yes. Okay. So it's Your room is also, very dark. Yeah. Whoa! Also, we <laughs> Wait, have that, that's... lots of lightings. These these know. shelves. Yes. I've never seen them like this before. <laughs> like uh, they're, they're plastic these are ones? plastic. Okay, is that common? In the yes, here. Yeah. Yes, in the Philippines, it's common to have uh, drawers like this yeah. because of termites. Oh. Okay. And um, plus, if you're into like, you you want to move from one place to another. Yeah. It's easier. Like also in Japan, this is very important to us. The rice cooker. <laughs> and the toaster. This is a new kitchen. This is my mom's dream kitchen. Oh. We wanted to have a big counter. Because the typical Filipino counter is just this one. And then this is where you just slice. And you wouldn't like my Japanese kitchen then. This is where we cook our food. But, but we only cook um, simple food here. Yeah. So if you want to cook like for example bulalo, like the one that we uh, the the beef, we we cook it here. So we use firewood. Okay. So there. So this is where my mom cooks. Plus if you cook the rice <coughs> using firewood, it's a different uh uh taste. So in the province, we also have this one. Okay. It, it, this is very essential. Essential? <laughs> yes. As was the norm, I was treated to some delicious food. So fresh fruits from her dad's garden and home cooking from her mother's kitchen. I even got a takeout container to go. Thank you. Now we're going to visit another gated community. The last one was in the provinces with houses and now we're in Metro Manila and this one is full of apartments and has a resort-like feel to it. So like what kind of people live here? Uh, so you'd think, of, think um, middle class to upper middle class because uh, if you look at the rent, so it's like usually the range is um, eighteen to twenty-five thousand per rent. And if you were someone that works in the in the office, if you were maybe in that office for like five years or so, your salary would be around the thirty thousand range. So only when you're a manager of a department, you look at a fifty thousand peso salary. So it's usually the people that are making at least fifty, fifty to seventy can afford. A uh, place like this. So let's take a little tour of the facilities available. There's a few pools. This one's for laps. Behind it is a covered basketball court. And in another building, we find the indoor gym. There were signs for noise and littering, and indeed, the place was quieter and cleaner than other places I visited. They have a little convenience store, and importantly, a place to fill up with clean water. There's even a water reservoir on top just in case. It's also right on the river with some green space to walk your dogs. So, yeah, that's the river. Buddy, hey. So, do you go swim in there? No. <laughs> no. Hell no. So, is that unit with the plastic over top, is that just for shade? Yeah. That, the one in the back is banana. When I asked to film inside, this is the response I got. Oh, but it's so messy and ugly and dirty. <laughs> <laughs> now We're everyone, over here, just with the plants. Just now like, everyone from, knows. From this direction. <laughs> <laughs> this spot looks pretty good. You got this pretty day, you got all of it, you got all of it. But they did let me film a bit of their workspace, which they use for their online jobs. And in the background, you can see the small kitchen that they have. 
We'll return for some home cooking and job talk later. However, let's now check out Eileen's parents' home, the biggest of them all. Yeah, it's this one with the massive square footage. I actually didn't film much since I know it's not close to an average Filipino house, but this is the guest room that I had all to myself. I even had my very own ensuite comfort room. On top of that, Eileen's mom left out all these goodies for me, which I had no opportunity to eat since she also made these scrumptious ribs. Now, houses that I didn't film inside of at all are informal settlements, or ISFs. People would build their houses to it to a point where it's already cement. It's not like wooden houses anymore. And then, so somebody's like, oh, let's develop this land now and they have to move. But right. like, our house is already made of stone. It's already cemented. It's not like we can pack up and go. Our livelihoods are here. So, and then they would like, well, wherever we're gonna go, you have to give us housing. That's been an issue past three years. And then they send them to the provinces where there's like actual houses. And then they go back saying, oh, we, we couldn't find any livelihood there. It's estimated that 1.3 million people, or 11% of Metro Manila's population, live in informal settlements. I'll quote the World Bank Group report. With in-migration of those aspiring for better lives from rural areas to urban centers came surges in demand for jobs, housing, infrastructure, and basic services in major cities. Yet, the government has been unable to address the increased demand given the accelerated pace. The result has been proliferation of informal settlers in urban areas without adequate access to decent living conditions. If you look at the wires, most ISFs have access to electricity, although it's expensive. In fact, the fifth most expensive in the world. As such, many resort to shared connection or jumping, an illegal connection to neighbors or public electricity. Only 46% of the homes have a proper connection. In my previous video, I already talked about how waste collection was an issue. What I didn't mention was that besides polluting the waterways when trash is dumped in there and polluting the air when burned, solid waste leaches into and contaminates the soil, causing health issues. And in my first video about the Philippines, I covered what the commute is like. Transportation is a huge expense for residents in informal settlements, currently comprising 15% of household expenditure and is only set to go higher as congestion in Metro Manila worsens. There are a variety of transportation methods that a Filipino student can take. For example, there's the school service van. You'll also see students being picked up in trikes that are likely picking them up according to a pre-booked schedule. In the case of the family I stayed with, they had a van that came right to their gates for the pickup. <laughs> it's this extra transportation cost, as well as uniforms, textbooks, school supplies, and lunches that make the free kindergarten to grade 12 public education system not truly free. As a result of those living in informal settlements, 22.4% had up to elementary school education or lower, and 30.6% were high school dropouts. So basically, half the residents don't graduate from high school, and the main reason seems to be financial both because of the cost of education as well as the opportunity cost of not having young family members contribute at an early age. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we enter yet another gated community to see how the super wealthy live in Metro Manila. They have security guards that actually do proper security checks, so we needed an inside connection to get in. Once inside, the cityscape totally transformed. This could pass for a street in Canada or the United States if you just took a quick glance. The streets weren't busy, it wasn't noisy, there were plenty of trees. There were joggers and dog walkers, and even houses with front yards. However, there were some giveaways that this wasn't a typical, if not wealthier, Canadian neighborhood. First of all, there were the gates restricting access to the area. Then there was the shiny fire truck out on the street. Lastly, there were the hired cleaners ensuring the roads were tidy. And I specifically said Canadian neighborhood because while there are plenty of gated communities in the United States, they are few and far between in Canada. To live here, in this exclusive Makati neighborhood, you need to be a millionaire. This is truly where the elites live, especially seeing as the mean household income in the Philippines is around 5,000 US dollars.
Since we're talking about money, let me tell you about these guys that fish for a living. We caught them organizing their hooks under a busy bridge, so the audio was unusable at some points. So they told us they go out on the water every day from 7pm to 4am, fishing using a flashlight. They sell the fish at a local market and then have to reset the 4,000 fish hooks that they cast. Back over at Jordan's place, we learn about his current employment status. I am uh, not employed right now, Okay. but I'm working on it. In Japan or Canada, when you're unemployed, the government mm -hmm. gives you money. So does the Filipino government give you money? No. A big no. Because no, if no. the government gave you money, nobody would Nobody would work. work. <laughs> okay, so then like, how do you survive? Here in the Philippines, uh, if we don't have a job, uh, we still uh, look for some, uh, some racket, <laughs> some side jobs to survive, yeah. Party organizer, yeah, like that. Oh, okay. We do some uh, pre-birthday shoots, birthday uh, presentations, like that. But with family, uh, we help each other uh, to survive, yeah. So he lives with his sister, brother-in-law, and nephew, and... It's my brother. He's the one who only got a job here. Over at Nicole and Norman's, we learn about online work. Uh, so I actually started in corporate, and then I kind of just got tired of corporate, so I decided to look for more freelance work because I had enough experience in my resume to say I can do certain things. It's a lot of project management, so a lot of e-commerce, uh, website creation, Amazon stores. So whatever you can do on the internet, basically I just figured out how to do and I offer it as a service. I actually just have one main client now, so that's usually enough to get you by because when you just compare the cost of living to how much you can earn in dollar, like it's very competitive. It's even much better than I used to make in corporate. Do you mind me asking how much you make? Or? Oh, uh, I make anywhere between 700 to a thousand dollars per month like just depending on if i can get more projects in right now i'm a web developer for a canadian company okay so like kind of like outsource yes with our qualifications and our educated background you think that we'd be doing more with our uh potential a good example of this is nicole and norman who both went to the third ranked university in the philippines de la salle Nicole has a bachelor's degree in creative writing, while Norman has a computer science degree major in software development. If you're, say, from the U.S. or from Canada, they have certain expectations from, like, someone who was educated in a third world country, right? So it's not, they, in other words, they just don't trust us with something a lot bigger, like, uh, like your business relies on this person. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, it, it's, it's too much of risk. I mean, you've never met the person. They, they're you thousands of miles away. You they're educated in a third world country. You don't know them quite that well. Beyond online work from home, or for a BPO, a business process outsourcing company, there are many Filipinos working overseas. They are called OFWs, or Overseas Filipino Workers, and as of 2018, there were 2.3 million of them. One example of a former OFW was our truck driver. He worked abroad in Saudi Arabia as a driver for about three years. Using that money, he was able to get a house. However, he didn't own his own trike, so he went abroad again, this time to Dubai for a year and a half and bought his own. Um, bago labas po to, Motorstar, kilala niyo po ba si Manny Pacquiao? Siya po ang endorser ng Motorstar. While some people I talked to had ambitions of becoming a citizen of a foreign country, Many others did something similar to our trike driver, who used it as a way to get a step up in life. Interestingly, while he owns his own trike, he says he doesn't make more than others in his association. But because he's an owner, he doesn't need to work in the evenings like the other guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. <laughs> so Filipinos from, at least from what I've read and from observation is, they're willing to bear that, that the whole, you're going out of the country for several years, you're not going to see your family, just to, you know, just to give them a better life because you're earning more than you ever could here. Because how much does a nurse make here? 15,000 pesos. That's, um, they... These numbers are from an online job site for Filipino workers, so I can't vouch for its accuracy, but having talked to several different locals, they don't appear far off. 
The column in the left is what Filipinos can make working locally, while the column on the right is what they could make working online. My next interviewee has also been working online, but is now in the process of moving to Japan to become an OFW doing factory work. So yeah, so I'm Saipreen and I'm from Baguio City. Okay, so I worked for a call center for like almost uh, over two years and that is for inbound account wherein we accept calls. So we take orders and uh, set them for pickup and delivery. Okay, and for who was it for? Okay, so it is for Swiss Chalet. Oh, Swiss Chalet. Not only a Canadian restaurant, it was, no lie, my favorite restaurant when I was young. I asked her what kind of money she made. Uh, I started for 12000 for my first year. In comparison, the NCR, the National Capital Region, has the highest minimum wage in the Philippines at 537 pesos, or about $10 US a day. However, where she lives in Baguio, minimum wage was more like 300 pesos a day. So by taking calls for Swiss Chalet, she was able to make nearly double what she could have with local jobs. Uh, for now, I'm working as a home-based online teacher. Her online work, which is teaching English to Chinese students, has the potential to make nearly double what her starting wage was taking calls for Swiss Chalet. So it's easy to understand why she upgraded to a job that she can do from home and on an hourly basis. However, recently, she's been training to work in Japan. For me, I will be working as a weaving operator in a company. I think that most of the Filipinos would um, take this opportunity to, um, like, to work overseas because of the salary, of course, and for the experience to go out of the country and, of course, to support their family financially. Supporting the family was a reoccurring theme in all conversations I had with Filipinos. I'm paying for my brother's tuition fee because my parents can't pay for it. So a lot of people will be in that same situation. They have siblings, they have parents who need their financial support. That's a very classic story. Yeah. That, if, if anything, that's an expectation for siblings, right? With Cyprien, it was her family who helped pay for her two-year information technology course, and it's also her family, especially her older sisters, who are helping to pay for her training to go to Japan. My father is an OFW, so that's why uh, he was the one who uh, financially supported us. He's been uh, in Canada for like six to seven years, and before he was able to like work in other countries as well. So we grew up like not being with him for like a very long time. Recently, her father got permanent residency in Canada. And while her mother and youngest brother, who is 15, were able to join him, Cyprien and her three other siblings were too old to be sponsored. While I previously said that there were currently 2.3 million Filipinos working overseas, an even more surprising statistic is that an estimated 10.2 million Filipinos have lived or worked abroad. Given that the country has a population of around 100 million, that's a good 10% who are, or have been, overseas. Okay. And I think every Filipino family has somebody abroad. My, my sons, two mm. sons, no? they are working in a ship. Uh, one of the reasons why they are working abroad is they like to see other places free. Of course, triple. the salary is... Triple. <laughs> when you work abroad, like the most minimum, like in a cruise ship where I worked, the smallest wage that you could receive is like $500 a yeah. month and that you don't pay for rent you don't pay for food yes that's 500 take home jessica's mother has two sisters working overseas one in japan in a tofu factory and one in canada in a senior's home please indulge me for a second as a flashback to an earlier scene so this is my cousin's uh, room he's staying with us like since he was a little boy so he's staying here right now yeah. because yeah. your sister's working in canada yeah yes well, he really go to Canada one day? Maybe. Someday. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> right now, he three, doesn't want. Three to four years from now. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to How old right is he now. now? Um, 14. 14. Yeah, it's hard age to move to a different country, right? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's him. Especially. I send him. 
Especially, yes. Edmonton. <laughs> Especially Edmonton. Yeah, <laughs> because he saw he saw the lifestyle of her mom there. Like yeah. they oh, don't have no. I know. This is my cousin. Yeah. yeah. My yeah. mom is in Canada working. Okay. In so your mom's in Edmonton? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you visited Edmonton? No. no. You have never me. visited Edmonton? No. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any plans of going there? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, almost nine years. She nine years. Yes, yes, nine years. So how often does she come back? Every, every three, years. three years. Two? Two years? Every three years. Three years. Yeah, three years. We sit, every three years only. We sit in Philippines. Yes, and then for she stays long? here for a month. A, a month. month. A month. Wow. You always prioritize your family before <laughs> before yourself so that's why <laughs> again i find myself about 25 minutes into this edit and i still have so much footage i promised to talk about food and travel in the previous video so how about this let's do a quick montage of a select portion of the food i had for example nicole specifically shot for and cooked me dishes like it's called kare kare because it looks like a curry so it's a filipino take on curry She also made It's called uh, Bicol Express because it comes from Bicol. I also went to a night market where, what do you know, there was music. I'm doing the takoyaki first. Wow, okay. And in Tagay Thai, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I also went to a Unlimited Wagyu Steak Restaurant But they're out of Wagyu, they're out of beef, and they're out of pork Essentially, most things we tried to order were not available, but we made the best of it <laughs> Out in Bulacan, we ordered so many dishes at this pick and grill place Just look at this montage And even though this is technically not Filipino food, these soup dumplings, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, were probably the tastiest dumplings I've ever eaten. And I mentioned these homemade ribs, right? I think they were the best ones to ever touch my lips. Despite speeding through all the food, let me just slow down a brief moment so we can find out about a popular Filipino export, bananas. I actually went to a few plantations in Davao. So Davao in Mindanao is the banana capital of the Philippines, basically. It's where we grow all the Cavendish for Dole and Del Monte. So she's talking about Cavendish bananas like this, which account for nearly half of global banana production. The thing about regulation there, it's very strict. Like, to be expert quality, you have to fulfill certain standards. So if the, banana, if the bunch of bananas don't fulfill that, then they usually get uh, rejected. So they're all put into this pile, either for disposal or it's just going to become animal feed it's because Filipinos don't eat, eat Cavendish. Instead, they'd prefer something like the Latundan, which I'm told are long and sweet and make great milkshakes, or the Lakatan, which is smaller, paler, starchier, and more filling. Now for that travel footage. While in the Philippines, I traveled a fair bit, often stuck in places a bit noisier than I like. One of my solutions for enjoying that time was to listen to an audible audiobook with my noise-canceling headphones. One of the books I'm listening to right now is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. I find it very fitting as I research about the Philippines as the book is about modern-day concerns such as work, international cooperation, trusting data sources, and immigration. With so much to worry about, what do you do? I think this audiobook helps give you perspective on big topics like those, encouraging you to be more thoughtful and less reactionary. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. I've personally been a member since 2011. If you're not already a member, get your first audiobook for free, plus two Audible originals when you try Audible for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash life where I'm from or text life where I'm from to 500 500. In case you're wondering, Audible Originals are exclusive audio titles created by celebrated storytellers from worlds as diverse as theater, journalism, literature, and more. One last thing, it's pretty risk-free to subscribe to Audible. 
You can cancel or pause your membership at any time. Plus, you can actually swap out an audiobook if you start listening to it and it's just not your thing. It's helped give me the guts to choose titles I normally wouldn't, since I knew I could always exchange them if I didn't enjoy them, which I have done on a few occasions. Again, go to audible.com slash life where I'm from or text life where I'm from to 500 500 to get started. Okay, so I actually have way more footage than that, but I wrote so much about my travels that instead of only giving you a one minute drone montage, I'm going to make one more video talking about that fantastic scenery I just showed you. So please be patient with me while I make it. Once again, thanks to all those that led me into their homes and shared their stories with me. I learned so much and was moved many times. And thanks to my Patreon and Indiegogo supporters for helping to finance this series of videos. And lastly, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. If you've worked abroad, what was your experience like? Free gravy refill at McDonald's? Nice.